Don't know nobody named Davis. So 1978, Paul Schrader had made a bit of a name for himself with several screenplays, most notably The Taxi Driver, which is a great film, it's a, it's a gritty realistic film, but, but Scorsese's visual flourishes sort of transcended that sort of gritty down-to-earthness and gave it a sort of magical realism, especially in the last section which many people think may be a dream. I'm not sure if it is or not, but the last section of Observe and Report definitely is a dream. Fight me. Fuck every one of you! In blue collar, there's none of that fanciful crap. It's just straight nuts and bolts down the line everyday life. Following these three characters, played by Richard Pryor, Harvey Keitel, and Yafet Kota, who are working in a car plant, and they've had enough of the the management's prejudice, inaction, the a union's corruption, and they decide to rob the safe of the union offices and then blackmail the company and see how that works out for them. <laughs> so from then on in things get more twisted and things get more complicated and more twisted and more dramatic from then on in we gotta figure we gotta think about that a little bit you know what I mean oh I always find Paul, Paul Schrader's scripts and films interesting he has a unique eye for male loneliness and he probes that very well but I always feel like they, they don't really amount to that much in the end not the whole thing but just sort of the last section never really pleases me that much it's like he doesn't He's he's very interested in this loneliness thing, but he doesn't have any answers for it. And maybe I'm asking too much, and maybe the answers are different for every person. But I've always sort of feel unsatisfied by his endings, except for this one. This one's very special. AK AK is for ass kisser. Ass kisser. And I think the sort of the reason the reason I do like this film so much is because there's there's the sort of political aspect of it, like criticizing sort of hierarchies and um, sort of union. Union, union corruption, which is it seems to be true in all the unions. So it kind of has that stuff holding together. But but at the front of that, it's it's real. It's the realism of it all, because you do just see these sort of three characters in their everyday life at at work, at home, out on the piss, doing whatever they do. So it has that to it. Even when it sort of goes off the boil, maybe on the political stuff a bit, or, or vice versa, that it can bounce between the two instead of it just being one thing. There's more more than one layer there. But the realism is is the most sort of astounding thing because, it, like Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor generally played comic roles, but the comic roles he played were really sort of silly and almost slapsticky. They were nothing like his stand up, which is weird. In this film, this film he plays a straight role, but it, it seems so much more like his um his stand up. Wasn't any good anyway. What you mean it wasn't any good anyway? You got any money to pay for it? No. Then shut the fuck up, Jack. No, it's so closer to that, and it's it's very funny in parts, even though. I don't know if he's trying to be funny, but because because he's played so straight, rather than sort of goofing off in his normal comedies, it's such a sort of straight role, and you can see the sort of anger and the hurt that went into him making jokes. Is is it comes through in his acting in this film? It's it's just it's such a great performance, and and the fact that he's got Harvey Keitel and Yafet Koto beside him, who were both great actors, especially in the seventies and this sort of gritty seventies realism that they they fitted into so well. He still stands out. I don't understand why he, um, why this is basically his, uh, as far as I know, this is sort of the only straight role he had, straight sort of pretty much leading role that he had. So I don't really, I don't really understand that because he, he's so good in it. Now this is for real. This is a hard ass outfit, and we don't take slackers. I ain't no slacker. And the, the supporting cast, then, the supporting cast are all great as well, and it's like, it's. This was sort of coming to the end at, at, to the end of the new Hollywood era. I think it's, it's seventy eight, so Star Wars had come out, so they were starting to Star Wars and Sorcerer had come out, and so they were starting to do. The, the studios were starting to take back a bit of power, but this film still it doesn't feel like that. It's still there's no pretty boys here. There's not even a main character. Everyone everyone looks like they should be there and fits in there, and the everything sort of drifts along in a not not a tightly structured way. It's sort of. Because it has those two elements, maybe the the sort of political bit seems a bit more structured because it's driving towards a point, but the the actual their their lives are just sort of carrying on as as their lives would in their everyday sort of thing, all the arguments and the bitching and the trouble and the drama, and the here and then the I don't know what that means. You need any mass smoke disguises, something like that. Maybe just in case. I don't know. Bandanas. Bandanas. Ain't that a bitch, man? If I get busted, I don't want to go downtown looking like no motherfucking cowboy. So yeah, it's almost like the last hurrah for New Hollywood because it sort of ended not long after this. I think if Saw Sorcerer was already out, I think Apocalypse Now and um, Heaven's Gate will have been in production at this point, and they, they were the ones that ended. 
New Hollywood era. If you don't know about that, the the New Hollywood era was sort of it started with Easy Rider and ended. It started with Easy Rider that was sort of a surprise hit that cost like two hundred thousand dollars, something like that, and um, it made a lot of money and got a lot of critics on side and stuff. And it came out of nowhere with this sort of fresh real realism and this sort of strange editing style, and it was telling stories that weren't being told when the studios were spending a lot of money on musicals and big historical epics that no one really cared about because there was so much going on in the sixties. This sort of this new generation was coming through that was a lot more politically active and didn't really want to go see people dance. <laughs> they wanted to see something that reflected their lives. So Easy Rider came along and made a lot of money and was made for very little money. So the studios for a while sort of sat back and were just like, yeah, you can go make a film because it's not really going to cost us that much. So they let all these people, all these sort of young directors who were just coming out, and they were just coming out of film schools as well. They were a new thing. So these people could go off and make all these films were very little money. But by that, by this time, by 78, people like Coppola, um, Michael Camino, William Friedkin, who'd started out making films for very little money, were making films for lots of money that were bombing, <laughs> like Sorcerer and Apocalypse Now and Heaven's Gate. On Heaven's Gate, uh, Michael Camino had them properly build a, a properly build a plumbed-in town. And then at one point, he just said, I don't like it, move it six inches that way. A whole proper town, not a set, a town. Is that, I think it's still standing. I know, for, I know for certain that Jeff Bridges lives in the whorehouse that was built for that film because it was a proper house. So it's crazy. So this was so this film came out towards the end of that. It's like the tail end of that because Star Wars Star Wars was out and that was when they started taking back the power and being like, well, no, we're not giving you that money to do that. And then we got into the eighties where it was all formulaic and sequels and more, more how we know it now. So this this is sort of the last the last hurrah for a film that doesn't have a main protagonist, doesn't have any pretty boys in it, doesn't have a, a clear plot, and it's just sort of it just sort of drifts along with these sort of peaks and troughs of drama and conflict. Yeah, I, I really like this as a sort of a last hurrah for that. Um, I think it's a great. It's probably it's probably Paul Schrader's best film. I think. And Mishima and First Reformed are, cl are close behind it, but then there's there's kind of bit of quite a big gap for me. With the rest of his films, because I, I find like I don't, I never connect with them all the way through, except for that, or for these, these three, I guess. <laughs> anyway, Blue Collar, great, great realism, great performances, great, great balancing of the political and personal. Um, if you've already seen it, drop us a comment. We'll have a, we'll have a natter about it. Cause I know some people don't like it actually. It's got some someone has said that it's um, it's sort of the political equivalent of that that crash film that won the Oscar. Is completely unsubtle. <laughs> and I guess it is the way that, like I talked about hierarchy and unions, it is a very sort of Marxist attack. Plant my ass, man. That's all you talk about, the plant. Everybody know what the plant is. The plant just shot for plantation. But I still love it anyway. I think everything works in it. Unlike his other films. But anyway, check it out if you haven't already. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you like the video. And I'll see you next week on another Reviews on Realism.